Hey folks, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast. This is the Q&A with Yuri Dagan, who many of you, hopefully most of you, have seen on my original discussion with him about the lab leak hypothesis for the origin of SARS-CoV-2, the cause of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our plan here is to have you give us questions uh, Super Chat questions will be prioritized. We're looking for high-quality questions and questions only related to the topic in our discussion of the lab leak hypothesis. So you can ask us about uh, other things mentioned there, but no general questions, if you would. Yuri, welcome to the Dark Horse Podcast again. Thanks for having me again. It's a pleasure. Uh, a lot of people were fascinated by our discussion, and I think it uh, is having an effect in the world. People are waking up to the idea that they cannot just simply dismiss this hypothesis, no matter how much that is their desire. It's great, although I mean, at this point, there seems to be so many other things going on in the world that I think it's kind of fading out of people's uh, immediate interests. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. On the other hand, I would say I don't think the two are unrelated. And because of that, we cannot afford to focus in one place and ignore the other. So certainly here in the US, we are seeing unrest of a kind that is, I think, in almost every way unprecedented. And that unrest is obviously related to the, uh, the lockdown in the sense that it changed people's obligations in the world. It caused them to uh, be more frustrated as the economy uh, began to take its descent. And so to the extent that, um, that unrest of this scale can happen in a country that is among the most stable in the world, to the extent that that can be affected by a pandemic that could emerge at any time, understanding what the roots of that pandemic are is paramount. We can't afford to have something throw us into chaos if that something is is preventable. So in any case, I, I do think you're right. People are much more focused on other topics, but I don't really see it as other topics. Yeah, it's definitely all interconnected. It is that. All right, so how about we start with a couple of questions that came in during the initial premiere of our original discussion. The first one is not about the coronavirus per se, but it is this. Am I right that the glitchy computers conspiracy from your talk with Yuri Dagan was a joke? If not, how do you assess the probability that it, was a, that it wasn't a coincidence? Thanks. You want to start with that? <laughs> oh man i mean i think it's mostly a co coincidence uh because it hasn't really recurred and i just as soon as i started having problems completely wiped out the system and restored from backup and the fact that it hasn't happened since at least to me I mean, probably just a coincidence the, the fact that it happened with some other people who were also involved with questioning the kind of the lab leak hypothesis it could also be a coincidence but we, we i think we're like half jokingly discuss it and put out feelers into the kind of the ether to see if there are other people ex experiencing something like this and you know if we as we i think alluded to originally if we hear about more people having some kind of technical issues or any other kind of weird things happening in their life you know that could start being to pattern but at this point I mean, it's just I think it's just a coincidence. Um, I'm going to take a slightly different tack on this question. I think one has to behave as if it is a coincidence, and it is almost impossible to rule that out unless somebody sends you a, an unambiguous message. But you had uh, a malware problem that took took. Oh yeah, and I. Go ahead. Sorry, I did start getting receive to start get start receiving a lot of like weird, you know, phishing emails. Almost, uh, you know, much much higher number of them. Probably just started like a couple months back, 
I never opened them, but uh, I, so I don't know if that could be related or not. Sure. So it's the one data point. Well, there's the possibility that people were eagerly trying to figure out what was on your machine. There's a possibility that they were trying to spook you. And there's a possibility that it was unrelated and just a feature of the world as it exists. But I would say we had collapses of our system here related to the podcast that were very unusual at a technical level. In other words, we had collapses that um, continued to plague us even though we had literally swapped out every component that could conceivably cause it. So that's an unusual pattern when, when one is troubleshooting. Does it mean anything? I don't know. I do know that the timing was conspicuous, but of course, coincidence, coincidences happen of their own accord. And what I would say is, if you're going to find yourself in a realm like this, where you have, you know, essentially some huge range of actors has an interest in this story, People want to blame China. China doesn't want to be blamed. Uh, lots of people have turned this into a political football, and they have interest in how it is understood. And so there's no shortage of people who might want to dissuade people like you and me who won't look away from the story. But one can't assume that every hiccup is that. And in fact, we had a, a hiccup at the end of our conversation, which I think you and I both read as very unlikely to mean anything. Why would you uh, disrupt the end of a stream? But I've had streams disrupted at moments that were very conspicuous before, and it started to happen. Um, I had one, the, the most amazing set of collapses we had was uh, right after I first started talking about your medium piece and its implications. So uh, I don't know what to make of all this. Again, I think one has to work from the assumption that this is an organic problem in a highly complex technological world in which lots of pieces that are made by different uh, different people are interfacing together. That's you know that's a bug prone world, um, but there's also uh, a lot that's conspicuous about the pattern. And because we all have a history of facing um, technical glitches in our computing lives, when something really out of the ordinary happens, it does have a different feel. Yep. Yeah. All right. I guess we can leave it at that. Yep, let's leave it at that. Um, the next question is, if the virus had escaped from her lab, why would Zhi Zhengli release the sequence for RATG-13 and place more suspicion on her lab? And then the second part of the question is, how do we explain uh, the samples and original uh, patients with exposure at the Hunan seafood market. You're probably in the best position to answer this, Yuri. Well, let's let's try. Let's just address the first point first. I wasn't very clear on the second one. Let's address the first one. So, why would she generally kind of release the RATG sequence uh, rather than just, I guess, keep being silent? Uh, well, the first and foremost, she already released part of that sequence back in 2016, I guess. I mean, she collected it in 2013, but they had a publication in 2016 where they uh, released a fragment of that sequence to GeneBank. And so actually by the time she generally released it in 2020, the full sequence, the full genome, there were already groups, I think with a preprint or just maybe some comments on a virology uh, blog somewhere who identified that very fragment, and they were essentially kind of on the on the trail of Xi Jinping, saying uh, this is the closest relative of SARS-2 that uh, we were able to find using you know the blasting of genomic sequences in the database. So unless she kind of released the full, she basically she would be made to release the full genome anyway. So it's I think it's much better for her to do it proactively rather than wait for you know some uncomfortable questions. And secondly, she could, of course, release the, the sequence that she most, you know, would be most favorable with. Again, I'm not saying she's trying to doctor it in any, in any way, but uh, it's, it's a possibility. So maybe she was trying to, she could have been trying to divert the attention of, of the people to uh, 
from the, you know, maybe a closer sequence they have in their possession by uh, using the, the fragment that she already uh, released into a gene bank years ago and then building around it with a 4% difference from the, the current SARS-2 genome. But I mean, she, it's not like she had an option of just staying, saying silence precisely because she, she already made known that they had the, uh, the closest fragment in their, in their possession. Yeah, I, I agree with this analysis. She didn't have a choice that it was the, I mean, if this had been an escape from her lab and she is aware of that fact, that's a big if, but if that's what happened um, and for whatever reason she was hoping that that would not be the conclusion of the scientific community, she had very little choice but to to release the sequence. And um, as we talked about in our earlier discussion, there's also the question about, is there something about the 4991 strain that is connected to something in possibly the database that was deleted that um, was very conspicuous? And by releasing it as if it was a separate strain, that it might lead people in a different direction. Again, this is speculative. We're not saying this did happen. We're not saying we know, but we're saying this is not behavior that suggests that this person is necessarily trying to shed light on what happened. If, you know, let's take the possibility that the Chinese government has exerted uh, pressure and said, we don't want this understood it could be that she's doing this under duress. So there, there are lots of possibilities. Um, but uh, there's, I don't see anything exonerating in her releasing that sequence. Right. And also, I think she released it after there was this Indian preprint that alleged some uh, small fragments from the HIV genome being present in SARS-2. And so maybe that was her kind of reaction to show that no, actually those fragments were present in the ancestral strain or like the close relative. And so she had to release that ancestral strain to kind of, you know, add evidence to her claims. And she seemed very upset with that Indian preprint. She, I think in uh, WeChat or somewhere, somewhere she said that uh, she hopes those scientists close their stinking mouths or something like that relating to that very a very preprint, and so that could be another another reason why she decided to release it. And also, it does seem that uh, there is, you know, maybe if not panic, but definitely some some duress, as you said, uh, that her team is under, and I'm sure the whole Institute of Virology is under, and they're getting some, you know, external co control from the military imposed on them from Beijing. The, Major General Chen, I think, she overtook leadership in, in the Wuhan Institute of Virology. And so it's not necessarily like a cold, calculated move. It could be, again, just something that uh, they decided to do to uh, exonerate themselves in the eyes of whoever. Maybe you know, their immediate uh, uh, like the imposed leadership from, from Beijing, they decided to show that it's not them. Finally, there is another kind of line of thinking, and this I agree this is a bit of a more conspiratorial idea that maybe this is her kind of signaling about some other lab, whereas her phrasing is a little bit interesting is that she says she swears uh, on her life that it didn't come from her lab. So this kind of opens, leaves open the possibility that it could have come from some other lab and she might know, but she's not you know, in, a, in a position to fully say this. And by releasing the sequence, she's maybe, you know, I don't know, giving some hints as to, okay, you guys figure out what I mean exactly where this could, could have come from. Yes, it, it would be wonderful. Yeah. If that's a possibility, it would be wonderful if, it, if um, there was some mechanism, as we talked about in our earlier discussion, if there was some mechanism that allowed people to securely uh, offer information that would allow us to put together the origin story of this this virus. Right. So let me ask and you this since, it, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Just one final point. Sorry, I keep, keep uh, getting back to this is it's also interesting what they didn't say. And what they didn't say is the whole backstory of the pneumonia in the, in the mine in, in the Yunnan in Mojiang, where they originally collected this RATG 13 strain. And they still, I don't think they today ever address this. 
But there was this outbreak of six miners who got pneumonia, after which Xi Jinping was called to the mine and did collect the sample. And I don't think nobody from Wuhan still to this day ever addressed this story. Uh, and we know that their leading kind of SARS guy, the academician, uh, Jean, non, I keep butchering his name, but he's like the Mr. SARS guy. He was in charge, essentially, of this pneumonia investigation. And he actually ordered the minor samples, uh, checked for SARS antibodies back in 2013. And I think they actually did the work in, in uh, the Wuhan Institute. And Xi Jialing was definitely in the loop of this work. And since this is still not mentioned to this day officially in, in, like in the Chinese press or in any of the scientific publications, it's definitely you know, still a big question mark. But uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, as you pointed out uh, in our last discussion, um, the place to, to pick up the trail would be those samples if, if we had access to them. Yeah. Um, so anyway, if the world is trying to figure out what to do next, that would be uh, a good bet in order to shed more light on the story. Um, you raised the issue of the claim that there are sequences from HIV in SARS-CoV-2. And I remember when I first saw that claim, I thought, no way. And then I saw some stuff that suggested to me, actually, there might be. And I, my first reaction was, wow, that would be open and shut case if there were. And then I remember looking into it and realizing that it wasn't. The reason it would be an open and shut case, I thought, was that coronaviruses and retroviruses are so distantly related, I mean, if related at all, that the transmission of sequences from one group to the other would likely have been accomplished technologically. But when I looked into the, that claim, I remember, I don't exactly remember what the evidence was, but actually I got the sense that it would not be that surprising, um, and I, I abandoned that that line of thinking. Do you have uh, thoughts or information on the possibility of HIV sequences showing up in SARS-CoV-2? Right. I, I pretty much dismissed it uh, along with everybody else when it was, you know, once it was analyzed that those actual sequences, the fragments, are just very short fragments, and it could have been just essentially a coincidence that, you know, the, pretty much any short enough strain of uh, letters showing up in any other genome uh, by pure coincidence. But uh, I think uh, this uh, storyline was picked up again by uh, Luc Montagnier, the French uh, Nobel Prize winning scientist, and he still continues kind of, you know, promoting this idea, although the mainstream, the scientific mainstream is uh, even farther from, from this uh, line of uh, reasoning as it is from a general lab leak hypothesis. But I have to be honest, I didn't really you know, get back into this, uh, or I didn't read his preprint, uh, although he has published a preprint where they seem to you know, provide more evidence of uh, some HIV-related uh, genetic fragments in SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, um, I recall looking into his work initially, uh, his credential is obviously based on such powerful prior work that it's very hard to ignore his belief that this contains uh, HIV fragments and that that essentially is a smoking gun. Um, but I remember looking into it and mechanistically I was just not compelled that the story added up. But certainly on the list of hypotheses, I believe it on, uh, we, have to, we have to analyze it carefully and figure out whether or not what is being claimed is sufficiently improbable that it implies a special uh, origin, origin explanation. All right. So let's see. Um, there was a second part to that question. Oh yeah. The this... Hunan seafood market. Yes. I'm not sure what was being asked, but maybe. I think the. I mean, at this point, we can pretty safely rule out the Hunan seafood market as the source of the outbreak, as has been ruled out by even, you know, the mainstream China. Uh, that's their official position now that the virus came into the market before it came out of the market, to use their quote. Precisely because even initially, there's this Lancet publication analyzing the first patients and the first, I think, three of the four patients 
that were treated in the hospital with the first uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus, three of the four didn't have exposure to the who knows seafood market, and that was kind of the early sign that uh, it's probably not the source of the outbreak. And later on, when they uh, analyzed samples from from that market, who, uh, although there's you know, very interestingly not very many samples were collected before the market was completely sanitized and, and scrubbed. But even still, like there weren't any animal samples of anything close to the SARS-CoV-2, just kind of human samples, which uh, almost certainly were just contaminated of people who had SARS-CoV-2 already, you know, picked it, picked it out somewhere else outside of the market and brought it in. Yeah, so I think at this point, yeah, we can just rule out the market as a source. We can rule out the market as a source. What we can say in retrospect is that the evidence for the market is circumstantial evidence, basically, of proximity, that there is no evidence of the virus in animals in the market, and there's evidence of people who had no connection to the market who were sick in the first um, the first round. And so that uh, effectively takes it to a, an extremely low probability. The interesting thing, though, is that in the announcement that China had revised its explanation and was no longer, um, it did no, it no longer believed that the Wuhan seafood market was the source, it also dismissed the laboratory origin hypothesis. So it sort of had this a poison pill aspect to it in which um, they they were almost like negotiating with the logic. We'll grant you that you're right, that the Wuhan seafood market is not involved, but the lab is also not involved with no compelling evidence of why we should assume that. Now, let me ask you, as long as we're here, the there are a couple of pieces of analysis floating around about behavior in and around the Wuhan uh, Virology Institute, Wuhan Institute of Virology, and hospitals in Wuhan, China, where there is anomalous behavior detected. And the claim is that these things imply um, that there was awareness of an accident in the case of the Virology Institute, and that there was awareness or that there was an, a medically anomalous influx of patients into the hospital. Uh, I guess this would have been October. Is that right? Do you have any thoughts about whether that, uh, the, those pieces of analysis actually imply anything? Have you looked at them? I have. I'm sure as everybody just, you know, once the news hits, uh, I looked at the information. and I, I think you're referring to two kind of different sets of analysis, first being the analysis of cellular signal around the Wuhan lab that reported some kind of uh, blackout period in October, I think early October. So when you say cellular, you mean cellular phone activity. Right, mm -hmm. right, exactly. Yes, cellular phone activity that seems, it's a, I guess, publicly collected database, like anonymized, which is used by uh, all sorts of commercial uh, intelligence uh, providers to I don't know, analyze trends of, of potential consumers. So basically, uh, a lot of uh, companies are collecting all the cellular data of pretty much everybody, and this data can, can be available to like, these providers who can mine it. Somebody mined that data and saw that uh, at the time of uh, I don't know, early October, there was a sudden drop in the usual number of cell phones and cell phone traffic associated with the area of the, kind of the, the Wuhan Institute's PSL4 uh, facility. And on the basis of this, they kind of uh, hypothesized that maybe this signifies some kind of accidents and kind of shutdown of the area. And also they seem to implicate that there was some kind of traffic shutdown because not only the lab itself, but the area around it, the traffic around, like the, the vehicular traffic with cell phones, I guess, they seem to apply has greatly diminished for, for a period of, I guess, two weeks or something. I'm, I'm saying all this from memory. It's been a while since I looked. I might be a little bit off on some of the data points. So that was one thing, and it was uh, released back in, like, I don't know, two months ago. And since then, nobody really had any follow-up, so it kind of died down. There was no follow-up investigation by a regular intelligence agency or anybody else. 
And then recently there was another circumstantial evidence of consumer trends released, which was uh, these, first of all, parking lots around Wuhan hospitals exhibiting many more cars uh, last fall versus the fall the year previously. And secondly, the keyword searches for, I think, diarrhea and, and fever, if, if I remember correctly, that kind of spiked in, again, I think it was October or maybe uh, late September, something like that. So they were trying to tie that into an idea that actually the virus circulating in Wuhan or in Hubei, the province where Wuhan is, much earlier than it was kind of officially, well, first of all, maybe recognized, and secondly, just maybe realized, maybe, you know, the hospitals or uh, the authorities just didn't realize they had this kind of initial stages of epidemic on, on their hands. I mean, it's, it's, it's a valid uh, hypothesis. Uh, the, it's, I don't know if how strong it is because, I mean, generally, I guess, every year we, we have all sorts of viruses uh, around this time. And uh, whether a spike in keyword searches for diarrhea is indicative of this particular strain or kind of the ancestral strain of SARS-2 being present in the population, that, I don't know uh, whether it's a, it's a valid kind of uh, conjecture or connection of the two, precisely because, I mean, even in Russia, there was a spike in pneumonias back in November, and there's a lot of, uh, or there were at least, I don't know if there's any more, but there were a lot of kind of, uh, again, conjectures that maybe we, Russia, had been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 much previously, and maybe we developed some sort of immunity, and this is one of the kind of popular people's explanations why we're not getting the same level of uh, pandemic back in, oh, I don't know, March, as the rest of the world was. The idea was, well, maybe we had it in November, and right? we didn't know this. Of course, then we, we got the same thing as the rest of the world, maybe just a couple of weeks delayed, and uh, that idea died down. Yeah. So I, I had the so, same same thought, which is that in order to assess, especially... No, it's actually true for both the cell phone data and the hospital data. What one wants to do is an analysis of if you survey an area at random that looks something like the Hubei province, for example, how often do you see something this anomalous, right? In other words, would you see lots of things that were there a virology institute? You might think it was an accident, but there's no virology institute, so you don't notice it. Um, so anyway, I had the same sense that the ice was not very thick with respect to these couple of claims. That said, it could be evidence. And if you found that uh, cell phone traffic dying down in the way that we see it in, in October around the Wuhan, the Wuhan Institute was a very unusual event, then it would be stronger evidence. But at this point, we in the public don't know how common these things are. And so we can't, we can't assess these pieces of data. Right. And another... A similar piece of data that kind of again went uninvestigated was this leak from U.S. intelligence that apparently somewhere in the U.S. intelligence community was uh, kind of ringing alarm bells in November that there is already an outbreak in Wuhan that it's going to be serious and that they see all sorts of disruptions already in place and supposedly this was November and this was published in Washington Post I think but then again it was like never followed up, so we don't know how real that info was or why did it ultimately you know, get ignored. So, I mean, still a lot of unanswered questions, and, and maybe at some point these all pieces of the puzzle, puzzle will fit, or maybe it's just kind of like red herrings and some misrepresentation or false leaks that we just kind of have to sift through. Yep. Ultimately. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question. Next question says, suppose we develop a coronavirus vaccine that with minor tweaks could also be effective on bats as well. Thoughts on dispersing in bat populations as an extra buffer. I have some thoughts here as a bat biologist. Do you want to start? Yeah, if I may let you <laughs> take that one. Um, so my first thought is, um, first of all, as widespread as fear of vaccination is amongst humans, it's even worse in bats. And so my guess is they just won't go along with it. <laughs> all right. In English, that was a hilariously funny joke. Only worth a chuckle in Russian, I guess. But um, so that's good. The uh, I think the real question here, first of all, the idea that you would have a vaccine 
in humans that works in bats. It's a question of how you would even establish that. I mean, it's obviously doable, but is it worth the extra effort to figure out whether or not, you know, if let's say that minor tweaks are necessary, that's not a simple matter to figure out what those minor tweaks are and figuring out how to vaccinate bats and whether it has worked is going to be a long-term project at the very least. And I think the really important issue is the same one that applies generally to this gain of function research for the purpose of figuring out how to prevent pandemics, which is if gain of function research is more likely to produce a pandemic than it is to give us useful information about how to present uh, prevent one, then it's not a good idea. And likewise, attempting to vaccinate bats against uh, against viruses that could leap to humans and then could evolve into a pandemic is probably going to create such an increase in the intensity of human bat contact with exactly the bats that are harboring these viruses that I would say it's probably a losing proposition to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think, you know, having some kind of bat vaccination program or even like a gene drive in bats to clear them of any sorts of coronaviruses is uh, not a very good use of people's money or time. Or yes, and plus might create extra dangers. Of, I think we're just better off leaving the bats alone, just both for research purposes and human purposes. And actually, I think Xi Jinping is one, was one of her missions to stop the kind of the barbaric notion of people eating bats. And that was one of her key points in her talk in 2018, in, in like a TED-like talk she gave in China. And she actually said that this is this pandemic is a payback for humanity for barbaric practices of imposing or like, you know, eating wildlife or something or disturbing wildlife. So in that sense, but, you know, we, I think before we start going vaccinating bats, we have a minor issue of not even having a human vaccine first. And this is desperately needed for you know our purposes. So let's let's first get that done, and then make any about anything else. Yeah. So I, I agree with you. The human vaccine is obviously the priority. Um, I think in the meantime, if we just ask the bats to social distance, that's probably the best <laughs> best we can do. Um, you know, f fly two wing lengths apart, that kind of thing. Um, all right. Next question. What concerns me most isn't that the experts got it wrong initially, it's how adamant they were that, that it couldn't be questioned or that they couldn't be questioned. I absolutely agree with this. Uh, experts are, they have to have leeway to get things wrong. And frankly, even the fact of certainty is a, an indicator that something has gone wrong. There was such a strong desire to shut down the lab leak hypothesis to begin with, that we weren't having a scientific discussion. We were having a discussion with scientists that was not scientific. And um, and as I pointed out in our discussion earlier, this creates a new problem for us, a novel one, which is the very people we need most to speak without us doubting their credibility have all indicted their credibility simultaneously. That really couldn't be a more dangerous circumstance. So hopefully we can learn that lesson as painful as it is let's learn it and never let that happen again yeah I don't really have anything to add you put it very eloquently thank you all right next person says in honor of the mighty pangolin i must say pangolins i hate that they were implicated in this story i'm a big fan of this creature um, so yes, the mighty pangolin, it's a shame, but do realize for anybody who's thinking that pangolins and bats are grotesque, that these viruses are parasitizing them the same way they are parasitizing us. So the bats and the pangolins are on our side, right? They didn't do this to us. Okay. Delicious too. Just <laughs> That's a terrible trip. Sorry. Yep. Sorry. Terrible. Um, actually I had an advisor... Uh, a guy named Charles Handley, who was one of the great bat biologists, uh, was the Smithsonian curator of mammals. And he, at one point after the Vietnam War, I think tried to convince 
the military that they should equip fighter jets with mist nets so that if somebody crashed in a jungle that they could feed themselves on bats. And in order to test that hypothesis or the hypothesis that that was a viable way to survive, he lived for a month that way. And uh, when I asked him how the bats were, he looked at me with no humor in his eyes and said, crunchy. <laughs> Um, so <clears throat> anyway, that also tells you something because, I mean, the bats he would have been eating were New World bats. I'm not sure that they're harboring large numbers of coronaviruses, but certainly this concern wasn't on anybody's mind when he did that work. So that tells you that there are dangers hidden in plain sight. Okay, um, next question. I'm struggling to understand what you are talking about. I am so interested and I want to learn more. Thank you. I highlighted this one because I thought it was worth giving a kind of one paragraph summary of what you and I are on about here, why this is a focus, why it matters. Do you want to take a crack at it or do you want me to? Please, go ahead. So I would say we have a pandemic. It's creating a tremendous amount of harm. There's the harm it's doing and there's the harm that we are doing to ourselves in an effort to stop it. The origin of that pandemic is of tremendous importance because one, it may contain lessons about how we ended up here that will allow us to prevent this from happening in the future. Whether those lessons are about a human behavior like uh, eating bush meat that causes us to come in contact with zoonotic uh, viruses or whether it's about gain-of-function research in the lab. It is important that we figure out what we did wrong so that we stop doing it and this doesn't happen again. Second thing is that to the extent that one finds the scientific community rallying around a point, expressing a consensus that is similar to what you would hear around the question of does the Earth orbit the sun or does HIV cause AIDS or um, any one of a number of secure hypotheses. When you hear that kind of resolute consensus and then you look at the data and you look at the analysis and the analysis far, falls apart and the data suggest a hypothesis is viable that has been uh, eliminated from the table, it suggests that you have a whole different vulnerability. And that vulnerability is in the way your scientific apparatus functions. And we are so dependent on our scientific apparatus being above politics and above the market and in a position to tell us when we are putting ourselves in danger that even just simply detecting that scientists are reaching a consensus that is not justified and spreading it as if it were, that is in and of itself a problem. So hear me very clearly. Even if it turns out that this virus jumped from the wild and got into the human population, evolved the ability to jump from one person to the next and spread across the globe, and the implication of a lab leak is false, even if that turns out to be the case, the consensus that scientists reached was not justified. Even if they turn out to have been right, the consensus and their certainty around it was not justified. And that is in and of itself an existential threat because we need the natural disagreement between scientists to tell us what possibilities surround us. We don't need false consensus. We need uh, frankness. And that's a tough lesson, but I, I think it's an important one to remember. Anything to add? No, excellent point. Uh, again, uh, I'm taken aback by your eloquence. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, so let's see. Next one. This person, just a comment, they say a chimera virus sounds scary. Downloading a, downloading a virus is scary. I would certainly agree. The ability to download a sequence that we know is infectious um, and then effectively leave it on the honor system that no one will release it, that's a terrifying level of power right so did they imply downloading like being able to print dna from a computer sequence and create a live virus out of that yep i think they're going from what you said that you could uh you could get these things printed at a lot of different locations you said something about there being places in china that would do it very cheaply 
Right. I mean, it's definitely printing you know, DNA or, or protein is, is very cheap, but it's not. I mean, it's not like anybody could do it. You actually need a virology lab, and you even have to stitch those pieces together and put it in live culture. I mean, you you could do it in a home lab or a garage lab. Don't get me wrong. It's, it doesn't require uh, all that different to set up from uh, just a garage and do do it do it yourself uh, facility. But hopefully, if you're you know ordering virus parts online or through any kind of provider, there is uh, some kind of screening process that sets off alarm bells, and you know you wouldn't be able to just like a bioterrorist wouldn't be able to do it uh, without anybody any kind of authority that um, tracking that down. But uh, state actors, yeah, you could do it, you know very easily, very quickly, very cheaply. So yeah, there's a scary possibility and we yeah, we go ahead. So are you suggesting that at the moment those checks exist so that only a state level actor or something like it I know they exist in the states. I mean yeah, you, you get flagged on the FBI and whoever list if you're ordering anything, you know, large enough fragment of any particular known pathogen. Uh, you, I mean, you could try and probably try to circumvent that if you really tried, but uh, I think especially after this pandemic, there's going to be very close watches. And usually the, the people printing this stuff, they, they kind of know where this is coming from. You, you have enough biology knowledge for people doing this. So you know, this is, wait a minute, why does he need you know this particular plasmid printed or this particular fragment? You know, anyway, so... Uh, on, on one level, it's uh, already being kind of countered by uh, the various intelligence agencies, at least in the States. On the other hand, I think after this pandemic, as we alluded to in the original podcast, you might get like new entrants, new terrorists, like looking at this and realizing how, how easy it is and how wide, wide reaching an impact they can have for you know, a few thousand you know, $100,000. Yeah. I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> yeah, I hope not too, but I, I really think hoping not it doesn't work. What works is recognizing that this danger is out there and figuring out how to make it inaccessible because, you know, the very nature of terrorists, terrorism happens when people are not powerful enough to cause a change they want to cause for whatever reason and so they seek some sort of power amplifier that functions through terror and certainly the relatively low price point for a huge amount of havoc that we now know is possible is certain to be attractive so that means we have to be much more sophisticated about preventing this because sure it's going to be out of reach for people who are small time enough, but uh, people whose interests are not honorable exist at every scale, and we can't afford to have this in reach for those with significant power and resources. Okay, so next question is an interesting one. I've heard this one a number of times. Do you think it's worth finding out what happened in China, even if it ups tensions between China and the US or the world? This could have big implications on trade and geopolitics, possibly even lead to wars or proxy wars. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'll start here. I don't think we have a choice. We cannot shield uh, an investigation into the origins of a phenomenon that's obviously putting a huge fraction of the world's well-being in jeopardy, irrespective of where it leads. Yes, it is potentially going to lead to uh, tensions between China and the U.S. and the rest of the world. On the other hand, I think we were very clear in our initial discussion that we don't really see this, if the lab leak hypothesis is correct, we don't see this as the responsibility of China per se. This is the responsibility of the scientific community that decided that it was safe and desirable to engage in gain-of-function research on bat born coronaviruses. And as terrible as the outcome is, I believe if the lab leak hypothesis is true, as in the form that we think it might well be true, that that is an honest error, a spectacular one, 
but um, the blame is not what this is about. So I am concerned that um, the Trump administration has sought as much as it has opened the possibility that this that the lab leak hypothesis might be real, it has also politicized that claim and made it, frankly, much more difficult for those of us who wish to be careful about this, because it is seen when one talks about this hypothesis that they are on a political side, which is not the case. So I would advise us to solve the problem of geopolitical tensions by being clear about the fact that this is a matter of great interest for humanity's well-being and that that requires us to figure out what happened. It's not a matter of blame unless something truly uh, unexpected happened here, like this was an intentionally released bioweapon. That would change this dynamic quite a bit because this would obviously be an act of war. But assuming that's not what happened, um, let's, let's recognize that what appears uh, possible and maybe likely here is an honest scientific mistake of spectacular proportions, and it wouldn't be the first one. Right, absolutely. For example, there's this 1977 flu pandemic, uh, H1N1, which I think the modern scientific consensus agrees now that it was a lab leak from China who have been working on some sort of vaccine for that strain, which actually at that time was already extinct. Extinct. I think it's the same strain that was the Spanish flu strain. And maybe they were, I don't know, or just in case it returns, trying to create a vaccine, which actually escaped the lab and started an outbreak first in China and then the Soviet Union around the same area. And for many years, it was taboo in, in scientific circles to, to even contemplate the idea that this could have been caused by a lab leak, although there were hallmarks like temperature sensitivity of, of the, this viral strain, which is a hallmark of like vaccine attenuation. And eventually, I think many decades later, it was then uh, recognized and acknowledged by the scientific community. Yeah, sorry, it was a lab leak. Uh, I think we might have just very similar situation here, whereas, uh, you know, in the immediate future, mm, uh, barring some, you know, whistleblowers or unexpected evidence come out, if the status quo remains, nobody's going to... Uh, acknowledge this was a lab leak if it was, or of course we're you know operating under the assumption that this is a lab leak if later on we have evidence that, oh no, actually this was a natural uh, outbreak and we show evidence of these zoonotic uh, animals who are the intermediate uh, carrier, then of course this question is off the table and we'll just be proven wrong and kind of eat our I don't know, tie and hat, whatever. <laughs> But if, if there was a lab leak, I think we're several years away, maybe if not decades of actually the scientific consensus acknowledging it and the kind of the, the state, the government's acknowledging as well. But it is interesting, I think you, you allude to this, that the American government can stop forcing the issue a few months back because they were pretty aggressive initially and then they kind of just stopped, stopped talking about it. And maybe they, at that point they realized that it was a lab leak, but it was a, a leak of research paid for by American taxpayers. So, uh, and collaboration with American researchers. So it's not, you know, it's not a very politically high dividend case to keep pushing. So maybe they dropped it. That's why they dropped the subject. Yeah, I, I have the same sense that there was a recognition that a story that looked politically useful suddenly became so complicated in terms of what it implied that there was a loss of enthusiasm on everybody's part for talking about it, which is really the reason that we have to pursue it. Now, what I'm hoping is that somewhere out there in the vi virology community, there are people who have the same sense that we do, that this story does not add up as a simple zoonotic jump. Doesn't mean it didn't happen, but so far we don't have enough pieces to see how it would have. And lab leak would make good sense and they're going to look each, at each other across the table and say you know what we actually have an obligation to say what we understand is true and why it suggests the map of probabilities that we see that would be highly desirable so hopefully hopefully they can hear how important it is 
that we need virologists to begin to rescue their credibility by telling us what we don't yet know about this story. Ho hopefully that will happen. I really, I really do think it's possible. And I should say there are a few courageous people uh, in virology who have very carefully indicated that this possibility is alive and um, that's a very hopeful sign. So uh, maybe we'll see more of that as people realize that this question is not going to go away until it's settled. All right. Um, thanks for doing this. It's unacceptable that the scientific community is so dismissive. Totally agree. DNA research has come a long way since I was reading black and gray rectangles on an x-ray film. You better believe it. I have to say I'm, uh, I'm old enough and I studied biology uh, in college long enough ago that I have the same sense of it's amazing how far we've come. And I guess the other thing I would say on that point is these things don't, the rate of change is not consistent. Fields get stuck. They don't make very interesting progress for long periods of time, and then suddenly they take a quantum leap. And so if you check back in haphazardly, sometimes you discover a field that was sleepy has made a ton of progress. And this is part of the reason that I said in our last discussion that I wanted a list of all the things that we're doing that are dangerous that I don't yet know we're up to that I know I'm going to find out about after the accident has already happened. The list of times that this has occurred since 2008 is long, and I want to know what's going to be added to the list so we can address it ahead of time. That's really where we need to be. You have anything to, to oh, add? Just interested. Who, who left that comment? Must be a very old person. Maybe Watson, Dr. Watson himself? <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> Looked at the actual X-ray crystallography pictures. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is a long time. Yeah, that's right. It's X-ray crystallography crystallography here, not just uh, Southern blot or something. Um, okay. I don't, uh, this one says, I don't fully understand the ethical implications of gain of function tests. I've heard the concept discussed in a negative context a few times. Would love to see the steel man case made for the positive in a future Q and a, um, I think we can easily steel man the case for, uh, for gain of function research. You want to do it? Why don't you start and I'll join? Sure. Um, gain of function research allows us to survey the capacity of viruses and the and to understand the harm they will do ahead of time without having to actually find these needles in a haystack out in nature. We can take things that are in the neighborhood, we can uh, composite them, we can uh, passage them, and we can therefore essentially um, see into a future that we would have to spend a tremendous amount more to discover uh, in the wild. And that amount of power is um, potentially very protective for humans. And the only argument against it is that we cannot control the... Um, we cannot control the substances that we have enhanced from the possibility of escape. But of course, humans are very capable of doing remarkable things and um, figuring out how to prevent an infectious particle from getting out of a laboratory. While it is a difficult problem, it's not an unsolvable problem. That would be the steel man argument, I think. Now, the answer is actually that there is a related rates prog problem. And the more of these enhanced viruses we produce, the greater the chances that one will escape. And because the um, ingredient that you cannot eliminate from the mix is human beings, who at the moment are absolutely required at the laboratory to do the work, you cannot eliminate human error. And if you cannot eliminate human error, and people have to go home to sleep and to eat and do all the things that human beings do when they're off the clock, you cannot prevent a leak. So it may be that the chances of creating a pandemic simply outstrip the chances of preventing one um, uh, if we're going to do this research. Now, I will say as a final piece, I did suggest in a prior discussion 
that if you were going to insist on doing this research, and I'm not sure that we need to do this research, I think it may be the best defense may be uh, limiting unnecessary and dangerous contact with wildlife. But if you're hell bent on doing this research, then maybe you should be doing it on a ship, right? Out at sea, a ship that when something escapes can be uh, quarantined from the rest of the world so that we don't run into this problem again. And if you think that's too much hassle, then I think you haven't understood how much danger we're putting ourselves in. Yeah, I actually like this idea because, I mean, there's already long expeditions that go out and study some marine life, and you can do joint expedition with some you know, isolated BSL-4, BSL-3 facility on that ship. I mean, it's definitely going to uh, decrease the number of people willing to do this research. So oh, yeah. <laughs> nobody wants to be stuck on a ship for a few months. But, uh, but if, the argument, if, yeah. if the argument is that we have to do this research, then how much do you have to pay somebody to live on a ship to do it? Exactly. Sorry, I didn't, didn't but, mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. It's a good point. But I don't know if I subscribe to that argument. I don't really see the, the, this logic that we, have, we are gaining actually from this gain on functional research. Excuse the pun. Because we're trying to... I don't know what predict a pandemic by trying to recreate in a lab one of the, the trillions of mutations that might or might not happen in nature, and then and then do what? Do, I don't know. Like create a as the Bayer lab and other labs are trying to do pan coronavirus vaccine or uh, therapeutic. Well, first of all, I don't know if, if the numbers are in, in our favor because we can't obviously recreate all the mutations that are might possible in nature might be possible in nature and that might actually jump over into humans. And trying to do so, uh, I think, creates higher risk uh, of happening in, in a lab rather than actually being able to prevent it uh, by by using this approach. And secondly, obviously. Well, in this case, we the Gita function research didn't help us come up with any pan coronavirus vaccine or therapeutic in time, uh, which you know I think they worked on maybe ten years, maybe more. So, and uh, again, you probably don't even need gain of function research to work on a pan coronavirus vaccine. You can just take the existing known strains and and work on those rather than try to make them even more pathogenic. So. Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree with all of what you've said. And I would add a couple things. One, if it turns out to be a lab leak, then we know that the very people who were telling us that we needed to educate ourselves about what an enhanced virus could and would do, because that would be protective, when it came down to it, didn't tell us what they had learned. In other words, as I've been saying repeatedly, part of what may be going on here is that this virus is adapted to laboratory conditions, some of them intentionally imposed and some of them quite accidental. So if it is true that this research is supposed to arm us with knowledge in order to better protect ourselves, but the knowledge isn't forthcoming at the point that the thing escapes the lab, then that would suggest that the whole thing was uh, a waste. So that logic doesn't apply if this truly didn't come from a lab, but if it did, I think we have to look very carefully at it. The last thing I would say is, as a bat biologist, I worked for years with bats. I captured them. I glued transmitters on them. I followed them around the forest. And at the time, it was not well understood that uh, there were these very dangerous viruses that we might be coming in close contact with. Now, the reason that I mention this is that I was not alone in doing this kind of work. There are tens of thousands of people studying wild creatures, handling them, and there is a famous instance of a fungus that is being transmitted to amphibians. The danger didn't go to humans, it went to amphibians through humans. Um, but it is not the case that all of these people who are working on an indefinitely large number of species in the wild are constantly creating zoonotic pandemics. Could it happen? Sure. But I think what 
those who are arguing that we need gain of function research to address the possibility of a zoonotic jump are ignoring is that human contact with wildlife is very ancient and very widespread. We have lots of diseases that have jumped through agriculture, for example, but it may be much less dangerous having casual contact with animals in the wild than we are being led to believe. And the real protection probably comes from preventing intense contact, like um, the butchering of wild animals. The butchering of wild animals obviously exposes people to uh, bodily fluids of these animals, and that is a very high likelihood of something jumping, which still doesn't make for a pandemic, because in general, if something jumps in such an instance, it will die out before it finds the the magic, the evolutionary magic for transmitting between people. But, um, you know, we have HIV AIDS, which we think came from a chimpanzee, probably uh, one butchered in the bushmeat trade. So that's a major indication that bushmeat's not such a hot idea. But the amount of contact is high already. The number of zoonotic jumps that have caused a pandemic from scientific research that is not gain of function in nature is very low. Uh, if not zero, I don't know of a case. Maybe somebody will alert us to one. But I think we've we've been f we've been falsely led to the belief that the chances that casual contact will cause a pandemic is much higher than it actually is, and the research has been portrayed as much safer than it actually is. Right. I think I know who you have in mind. <laughs> okay. All right, we are at one hour. Let's uh, get through some more of these questions. Um, all right, here's- Sorry, just if I may finally- Oh, sure. Uh, add a final note to that question. I think you were referring to Peter Daszak, who was trying to make a case that these uh, zoonotic jumps happen on a regular basis. And was using one of uh, his kind of, I think, flawed papers where they saw six farmers uh, be infected, uh, not infected, to carry antibodies for a particular strain of, uh, of bad coronavirus out of like 218 people to justify this number that there's like a million to seven million farmers in Southeast Asia who are exposed to these zoonotic jumps. But, uh, and I think, yeah, that's not really, really correct. Uh, and finally, I think, as we mentioned in the original broadcast, or as I mentioned, I think it's a much better way to spend the money spent on gain of function research to spend it on uh, uh, tracing of various epidemic outbreaks that happen all across the world to be able to very quickly identify such epidemics. And these days, the cost of uh, full genomic sequencing, you, know, you could sequence uh, the virus, the viral strain uh, pretty cheaply and pretty quickly. It's so cheap now that, you know, whereas it wasn't 10 years ago, so 10 years ago, you could have been, you know, making a case that we need to be prepared. But these days, we can actually very quickly in real time find what exactly is causing a small outbreak, a big outbreak, and we can get the genomic sequences of all the virus viruses making kind of a new appearance or confirming that this is a new virus, it's a new outbreak, or this is like, a, you know, same seasonal coronavirus strain or influenza strain pretty quickly, pretty cheaply on a very distributed scale all across the world. And I think this is what we need to invest as globally as, as, as a society into at this point. Uh, much better, I think, will give us much better outcome than gain of function research. Yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with that point. And I guess I would add a couple things. One, I think we need some better language. The idea that a zoonotic jump is a massive danger is really covering the fact that this is two steps. Zoonotic jumps right. probably do happen regularly. Zoonotic jumps that catch on, that after they have jumped, make the evolutionary discoveries that allow them to spread across a large population, that's probably very rare. And so anyway, I think dividing those two things and figuring out actually probabilistically, where is the place to prevent this, right? Um, it would be a better investment. And then the other thing I would say, which this has just become very clear in my mind, is that part of the problem is that we don't take normal, regular pathogens that we're familiar with nearly seriously enough, and that there is a lot we can do um, monitoring 
the circulation of pathogens and interfering with their ability to jump between people that we've only just begun discussing in the context of COVID-19. And so I would advocate that we got smarter about how not to transmit pathogens to each other, you know, in the same way that um, hygiene uh, greatly increased our resistance to things because we just figured out how they were spreading and figured out how to stop doing it. We now have technologies at our disposal that would allow us to prevent this from happening in all sorts of contexts where we are actually inflicting it on ourselves, like our HVAC systems, right? We could design HVAC systems that are excellent at clearing viruses from buildings. At the moment, lots of them just spread these things around buildings. So, um, so anyway, there's lots of room to make humanity safer and better that doesn't require this high wire act of gain of function research. Yes, definitely agree. All right. Uh, next question. Have you interviewed a virologist or other expert? And they suggest Alina Chan, perhaps a couple other people. Um, I would gladly have a virologist on. I'm a fan at a distance of Dr. Chan's work. I would say in the current environment, there is, I think, likely to be concern, even amongst people who are like-minded about what may have happened here, about talking to anyone who is being dismissed as a conspiracy theorist. And I've tried to be very careful. Conspiracy theorist is a stigma-inflicting uh, term. This is a hypothesis. It functions like any other hypothesis. It's a question of whether or not uh, the evidence supports the hypothesis or not, and eventually, hopefully, one hypothesis will turn out to be clearly enough supported that it then becomes a theory. It doesn't start out as a theory. Um, but I would be, I would welcome such a person. I would have Yuri back on. We could jointly talk to such a person, but I also understand that um, this is, in addition to being a very important scientific question, this is a dangerous question to people's careers, and um, people will have to decide for themselves whether or not they can afford to uh, engage with people like Yuri and me, whether that's safe for them. And I hope that they can figure out how to make it safe, because as we've been very clear about, this, this is a matter of global importance. Anything else to add? No, I, I think you can put out a pretty wide call to any virologists or anybody who opposes the lab leak hypothesis to join your podcast and you know debate this freely and openly or on, a, on the podcast or any other format that they see fit. I think it'd be a very, very good thing for the community. I agree. Okay, let's see. Uh, if the virus is mutating, why is it important to know its origin and might it mutate enough that its origin may never be known? Well, I'd say that this, with respect to the second, there's no reason that it's current mutations. And mind you, it's not an it. It's many strains. And one of them could mutate so dramatically that it's, I don't know, conceivably hard to connect to other things. But given that we're tracking it, that won't happen without our awareness. Um, but even so, we have samples from what it looked like very early in the pandemic. So there's really, there's no way it can hide. There's just a simple question of what the evidence is about what it is most closely associated with. And the fact that different components map to different origin populations is a conspicuous fact, not impossible to explain through a natural process, but difficult to explain, especially in light of the absence of any ecological connection between different hosts that would make it likely. So anyway, it, we're in a landscape that's actually, the tools are well understood. They're the tools of the scientific method. And I see nothing special about this other, other than the fact that it is so politically charged. Anything you want to add? I, well, I, I think you can maybe address the point of why it's important to know the origin oh, yeah. for, for us. I think you have a very good explanation that you presented in the original podcast. Yeah, and I think we've covered it here too. I mean, at the very least, oh. preventing this from happening again is justification enough for chasing this all the way to the bottom. Um, so, 
There it is. Okay. Um, somebody wants to know about the Gaia hypothesis. That's not directly relevant here. Uh, how connected are the Wuhan scientists to the global research community? Wouldn't other parties be aware of what they were working on from similar labs? Yuri, you want to take that? Sure. Uh, highly connected, uh, is probably as connected as it could be. There are two leading centers of uh, coronavirology in the world. Wuhan is by being one, and the other is Barrick Lab and uh, UNC. And they've been collaborating quite uh, you know, closely. Uh, there was a conference in Wuhan, I think almost every year. There, there was one in 2018. There's this nice picture of everybody, including Ralph Barak and Xi Jinping, in the Wuhan conference. This very nice shot. We call it the Wuhan clan. Sorry. <laughs> uh, and so they're very uh, well connected into the, yes, the world community. And I'm sure that, you know, behind closed doors, people... Uh, talk about uh, you know what they've been planning to do or they have been doing and have awareness of things that have been unpublished or were kind of the research direction they were planning to take many years down the road and also the actual postdocs that you know work in one lab that switch into a different lab they all know the internal kitchen but I think there's a bit of a kind of internal scientific code that you don't really kind of snitch on your uh, supervisors and, and colleagues uh, it's, it's because you know that it's the whole community the, the, the whole field of virology you know functional research is going to take a huge hit financially or whatever if this is indeed proven to be a lab leak hypothesis so nobody has any motivation to speak out or even if they can suspect anything there's no, they don't have anything to gain by speaking out. So this is my understanding. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. So maybe if you have a different view, you can correct. Yeah. Correct my views. No, I think, uh, I mean, I think people should look for themselves and you can just see what the coverage of Xi Zheng Li is. You know, she's given a TED talk. Um, these two labs are connected. Yuri in his Medium article does a great job of pointing out what the friendly competition between these laboratories looked like. But it's a very small community. And actually, this goes to this next question uh, on the list. Why won't international virologists support an investigation? Which I think is the same question. In some sense, uh, I'm going to say something very nasty. I've seen it from the inside and this is a major threat to our ability to think clearly about scientific matters. The problem is that scientists have been turned into salesmen. In order to get your research funded, you have to portray it in a light that it is uh, very important and that you're in the best position to do it. And you end up saying a lot of things um, in order to get your grant funded that actually an objective analysis probably wouldn't support. And then you have these little networks of people most people cannot evaluate a grant by a virologist about gain of function research. So the people who are doing the analysis of the, of the claims are involved in the same work. So A, they're predisposed to see the work as similarly important and B, little reciprocity networks develop. And so people are funding each other's grants and supporting uh, their claims. And what it results in is science that is increasingly just disconnected from reality where you can't tell whether or not something is really promising or is really dangerous because the people who are in the best position to tell you that have a conflict of interest. So what we're seeing is what happens when you don't protect science from conflicts of interest. The most important thing that a scientist can have is the ability to tell you what's actually going on even when it isn't good for them to say so. That is a vital capacity and we are destroying it by letting the market uh, uh, the market adjusts the way science ebbs and flows. The market is too closely connected to science, and it is turning our our scientists into uh, hucksters. And we got to cut it out. I mean, what has to happen in order for us to to see the danger? 
Yeah, it's, it's a great point for all of science, actually, not just virology, because uh, there's this huge conflict of interest in this internal kind of you know, old boys club being reciprocity in being in the center of all these relations, whereas, you know, I submit a grant, you're going to be the reviewer for my grant, you know, you'd be nice to me, and then if your grant comes along, it'll be nice to you. And these kind of self-perpetuating you know, decades of, of grant uh, funding being you know, spent on, and sometimes it's research that is not, basically it's, it's, it's done at a much slower pace than it could have been because it's just much more comfortable to do it slowly because you know, you, you're going to get a next grant and the next grant, and maybe you could have done it in maybe one or two studies. You are sometimes inclined to, greatly kind of spread out the research so that you know you do it for five years or really longer so it's i'd say it's a much bigger issue than you know, much bigger issue than virology it's a whole issue of scientific funding it's a, it's a very good model at this point but <laughs> probably better than whatever was available you know decades and centuries prior but still i think it could be better to properly align the incentives for scientists to be still kind of on the cutting edge, to be honest, and to be, you know, not afraid to to challenge the, the group think that sometimes is very present in some of the fields. Absolutely. Okay, next question. Is it possible that the Chinese themselves did not know initially that it had leaked? You'd think they would have acted sooner. Now, my yeah. my sense is I'm not sure what I would expect them to do because you have to think about what these things look like as they emerge, right? You get some cluster of pneumonias. Maybe somebody in a hospital thinks, is there something going on? But maybe three quarters of the time that somebody says, is there something going on? It doesn't go any farther than that, or it turns out to be just an anomalous cluster of cases that are unrelated, right? Um, and then in order to test. So how often do you want a doctor who thinks, am I seeing an unusual phenomenon here that could be an outbreak of something new? How often do you want that to trigger a search for a viral particle that might be causing it? And then from there, let's say, okay, you've got a spate of pneumonias and then you find a viral particle you haven't seen before. Are the two connected? That's a difficult piece of research to do right there. So I think the point is that there are so many steps in establishing what's going on before you pull the uh, the emergency brake that you don't necessarily want every time some cluster of something emerges for the emergency brake on global travel to be pulled, for example, right? We We set the bar somewhere else because if we did that, then we'd be pulling the emergency brake all the time and it would be for nothing. So I don't know what this looked like inside of China. I know that in retrospect and from the outside, it looks like they moved way too late. And I think there's a lot to hold them responsible for in that regard. But if you were in charge of building a system for figuring out, you know, when to pull the emergency brake and what to do next, I think you'd begin to recognize how complex a problem that actually is. And this is where uh, being proactive and creating an environment in which things are less primed to spread would probably be a wiser investment. I'm very curious to hear what you think about that, Yuri. I, I think I, I agree with most of the points, or probably everything you said. Um, Kind of back to the original question, I, I think it's very possible that, yes, the Chinese themselves, I mean, at some higher level of Chinese government themselves, they didn't realize uh, what had happened and maybe they were misled by kind of the local government because we, we kind of know that the local Wuhan government was denying there was any kind of outbreak and then the Beijing had to actually step in and I think they actually removed some of the uh, local leaders and, and reprimanded others. And initially, uh, I think it was the idea of the local government to kind of quell down all the mention of a potential pneumonia outbreak. It was the local authorities who were, uh, I think, targeting that Dr. Lee, I think, the, 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 the whistleblower, the initial person who uh, kind of blew the whistle on pneumonias in uh, WeChat, 
let it actually succumb to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but then kind of the, the big, the federal government stepped in and uh, maybe kind of, they, they were already painted in a corner where they couldn't really admit, even if there was a lab leak hypothesis, they couldn't admit that there was one because, you know, saving face or whatever. But uh, they initially were, it's highly possible they were misled by local authorities. And the actions of the federal government kind of hint that they were extremely unhappy with the handling of what the local government did and or the management of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, precisely because they instituted this Major General Chan as the head of the virology, who is she's a military virologist, and she overtook the leadership of the, of the Wuhan Institute. I think that's a big red flag that kind of the government, the Beijing government was very unhappy with what had gone on or how it was handled in the lab, uh, how the I don't know, previous work was handled or how the outbreak was portrayed or how data was shared with the world or whatever. But obviously the actions that they took, the Chinese federal government, I think they're indicative of the unhappiness. Um, so yeah, I, I think we addressed this, this question thoroughly enough. Yep. Of course, we, we don't know any any potential, potential deeper details, and only time will tell, but it's highly possible. Yep. Boy, wouldn't a little bit of transparency be wonderful? Yeah. Uh, and, and even, yeah, and sorry, and like not to belabor the point, but the, the thing that, that they did close Wuhan, they, they still allowed the Chinese New Year celebrations to go on, even though it was, I think at that point, pretty clear that there's something bad going on. That's a big, big mis mistake, I think, for you know, both local and the federal government, which is probably costing a lot of lives. But, you know, hindsight is 2020. Which, well, uh, hindsight is apparently not 2020 because we're in the midst of making the very same mistake here in the U.S. where we have suddenly decided that uh, some groups are creating a a hazard of viral spread by protesting and other groups are not, which is a very odd situation so as we yeah i saw this kind of one california county saying that uh big gatherings are limited to 10 people unless it's a protest then 100 is allowed something like completely log illogical like that well it's even but it's even worse are, than that it depends what you're protesting is the problem and uh the, there's just no argument for this so i agree obviously a gathering of more than 10 people if it's a protest doesn't make it any safer we don't know how safe it actually is because as we've talked about before it doesn't seem to spread outdoors as i've also mentioned before i predict that that will change and it will get it will evolve to be better at spreading outdoors so we should be very careful about things like large gatherings but the political double standard in terms of who we're going to shame for protesting in the midst of a pandemic is uh it's kind of mind-blowing to see it all right um hmm. what can we do to but yeah oh, go actually ahead. go ahead sorry in, in terms of uh, maybe not learning the lessons uh, many countries are probably opening up too early including russia probably who are well, in, at least Moscow, because Russia is a very heterogeneous in different places. Some places didn't have any anybody sick, so they didn't even have a quarantine. But Russia, I mean, Moscow had, uh, I think it was like almost 300,000 people infected. But Moscow completely lifted all travel restriction, restrictions last week, and now they're actually opening up some outdoor cafes and restaurants. And next week, they're going to fully open uh, all restaurants. And uh, maybe it's a bit too early because we still get like 1,500 daily new infected in Moscow. Whereas you hear in Beijing, I think they had some traces of COVID, of SARS-2 in, in a fish market and they completely shutting down the whole city. So the kind of the, the difference in approach is, is very, I think, illustrative that maybe, you know, they're now, the Chinese are taking it much more seriously than the rest of the world. Yes, I agree with this. Um, New Zealand seems to have cured its problem, providing a model for what we should have done. But the whole thing is just so incoherent that really, if you're going to open back up before the thing is stamped out or under control or you have a vaccine, the obvious thing that you need 
is ubiquitous, highly reliable testing so that we can just simply take those who are in a position to spread the thing and eliminate them from a position to do it. And we just, we aren't there. We have really cruddy testing. It's not widely available. Uh, and so anyway, I find the entire response so incoherent as to be just absolutely maddening. Um, and we're playing with fire. We don't know what this thing is going to become. We don't, we don't even know what it is. We don't know that if it hides in some tissues and recurs, if you can get it multiple times, if it gives you lasting damage that knocks decades off your life, we don't know. So anyway, we're playing with fire. Unfortunately, yes. Yes. So. Okay. Um, what can we do to create safe spaces necessary to be able to examine uncomfortable data? Not safety from offense, but safety from having your life destroyed for giving offense of making an error. This is what science is supposed to be. This is what science is supposed to be. And the fact that it isn't that tells you that we have a sickness that has no name. We have lost our greatest asset, which is a scientific apparatus that is capable of telling us what we need to know rather than what we want to hear. And I don't know how we create that in the current environment because market forces are so dominant and our uh, subscribing to them as something like a religion has caused us to turn something as important as science over to this thing that is incapable of managing it properly. But we must. If we are to navigate with the kind of power that is now at our disposal, we need a scientific community that is tolerant of all viable hypotheses, irrespective of what they might imply. Something to add? No. Okay. Uh, Yuri mentioned there was some sort of tag that could be used to detect if the fern site was still present in a culture. Could you elaborate on how that mechanism works? Is it commonly used? Thanks. Oh boy, I can try. <laughs> so uh, the way the furin site is coded for in the nu nucleotide sequence, the two arginines are coded for uh, a, the codons that are recognized, like the, the sequence of the codons is rec recognized by what's called this digestion enzymes. And there are dozens, if not hundreds of different digestion enzymes that are essentially same as kind of furin is an enzyme for recognizing and cutting protein sequences, digestion enzymes are uh, enzymes that recognize a nucleotide sequence and cut it. And they're used for all sorts of uh, genetic recombination or whatever, for sorts of purposes that bacteria or other organisms have, you know, invented them for. But for modern biology, uh, genetic uh, manipulation tools, we, we now kind of were able to uh, use the, the, them for their for our purposes, which is you can slice in a given uh, spot of a nucleotide sequence using a digestion enzyme. So there's a particular enzyme recognition sequence, and you put that enzyme in culture, and it will cut at that particular spot, whatever you you know you use it, you give it. And so this furin site has one particular uh, recognition sequence that can be recognized by what is called the FOL1 or FAL1 restriction enzyme. And so if you, you can use it as a screening tool in culture for what is called the kind of the R-flip method of uh, screening is, is a restriction fragment length polymorphism. So basically the different length of fragments that will show up on your, on your if you run a, like a gel uh, for your experiment, Whereas, you know, if you didn't have that, that, that in enzyme site, you'd have a one long kind of stretch. But if you have it in your culture, it will be cut. So you have two short fragments. And so this is the, 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 the different length. And that's the polymorphism that is used to, to, to be able to screen for presence or absence of this cutting site. I hope I didn't you know, confuse. Maybe you're much better at explaining things than I am. Well, let me let <laughs> me. Your commenters have pointed out, so maybe you can. Let me. Out. I mean, you're of course working across uh, a language barrier. You're obviously fluent, but it, 
and English is not your first language. So, uh, and this is tough material too. Um, let's put it this way. Let's say that you had a special kind of scissor that cut up, it cut up a book only where it found uh, a particular sequence of letters and you could point it at any book and it would divide the book into all of the fragments between that series of letters wherever it shows up. So um, let's say you took the sequence of letters meta and you had every book cut up uh, at every place that um, meta showed up in the text. Well, that would create a lot of fragments of arbitrary size. You could then separate those fragments from each other by doing something like running them up a gel, putting an electromagnetic force at one end of a gel, and then the, the fragments would migrate uh, some distance. The bigger the fragment, the slower they would move so that they would separate themselves out and you would get strata. You could look for a strata that had a target length sequence. So if there was a particular, you were trying to figure out whether or not you had a particular paragraph, right? whose length you knew because meta appears here and meta appears there. So you know what fragment you're looking for. You run these things out to get them to separate, and then you can see whether or not you have a fragment of the correct length, right? Now there's a lot of technical detail in how it is that you calibrate these things so you know what length you're actually looking at, but nonetheless, it can be done. And what that means then is if you introduce this site into a viral genome in order to... Uh, you know, if you're introducing the fern site for your own purposes, you want the fern site there to enhance transmissibility, then you've created, by adding this flanking sequence, you've created a, um, a target fragment that you can then search for and detect whether it is present or not. Is that about right, Yuri? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then you can screen for colonies for either the presence of this fragment or the absence of this fragment depending on your purposes. Yeah, so you can screen anything for a fragment that's this length, and then if you want to do further scrutinizing, you can actually take what was run to that place on the gel, and you can investigate further what's in it. But the quick and dirty test is just, is there a fragment of the right length? Right, and can it, the, the use of, of, of these fragments um, in, in biology was much more prevalent before, you know, the full genome sequencing or NGS was uh, much more cheap uh, as, and, you know, available as it is right now, whereas before, you know, sequencing could take much longer or you wouldn't be able to sequence as frequently because it was expensive. But using the, these kind of uh, methods like RFLIP uh, was uh, just a quick and dirty way of, of screening colonies. And today it's not as prevalent of using uh, this method because you can pretty much sequence any colony you have, but it could still be in use as, as a very you know, uh, robust method for if you have a very large library, you need quick uh, access to it to be able to tell if you got the right colony or the wrong colony. And it, it's definitely, help, having that sequence in is definitely helpful. And it's, it's just odd because the, the codons coding for this for the arginines and creating this furin site, uh, this digestion enzyme site, they're very rare codons. That they're not uh, uh, usually used in uh, coronaviruses or, or uh, this lineage of coronaviruses. Usually arginines are coded differently. So it's just odd to see. And it's like two exact same codons, very rare codons in, in sequence. So it's just odd coincidence that again. Yeah. You know, if it was man-made, it, it would make all the total sense. Of course, it could be just a coincidence. So if I can sum this up, there are lots of little techniques that people who are skilled in the laboratory arts use to make their own work simpler, right? Just the same way a, a programmer would put in a little piece of code that would allow them to check whether some subroutine was doing what it was supposed to or something like that. There are lots of little tricks you can put a little, uh, you can add something that will cause a, um, a particle to fluoresce if it's present. And so then you can just, you know, shine a particular light at a colony and see whether the thing is there, that sort of thing. These things are everywhere, these little techniques that just facilitate laboratory work. And so what Yuri is saying is that 
to code for arginine is common, but the way arginine is coded, the particular codon that is found in this particular sequence next to the furin site is conspicuous in that it is absent from most coronaviruses. So for whatever reason, coronaviruses don't produce it normally uh, or not very regularly. And right at a site that we're talking about, how did this, A, why is there a furin site? That's uncommon and conspicuous. B, why is it an insert rather than a series of mutations? And then C, why does it have this conspicuous um, uh, sequence next to it that has a known use in the lab and that um, is coded for in a way that um, does not suggest a normal natural process in these viruses because in general we don't see it? That's three pieces of evidence related to the fern site that don't it's not the smoking gun, but it's certainly conspicuous that somebody working in a lab facilitating their own work might have added this sequence in order um, to be able to cut at that exact location and um, uh, done it in a way that fit their laboratory modality rather than uh, some sort of natural process. Yep. Perfect summary. All right. Uh, let's see. What do you think about the full, the full of misinformation World Health Organization link under every video, even mentioning the virus? Um, I get the problem. You got a lot of misinformation. You've got a lot of people spreading low quality uh, conspiracy hypotheses. On the other hand, Google doesn't know what a counterintuitive hypothesis that is important sounds like. It doesn't have an algorithm to figure it out. It doesn't have a team of biologists who are capable of sorting it out. And even if it did, that team of biologists is going to suffer from the same kind of perverse incentives that our uh, virology community is suffering from. So in some sense, I think the only rational thing you want to do is leave it so that, yes, cruddy information can be presented. People are in a position to evaluate it themselves. But that means that the ideas that people want to shut down, um, but that are correct, are also allowed to, to get into the world. I, I just don't see an alternative system at this point. So I'm very much against these warnings, because I think they basically are a wink that says, um, this is not a sanctioned idea. And this is not a sanctioned idea. Yes, we'll eliminate a lot of garbage, but it will also eliminate the stuff that the system doesn't want to hear the true stuff that the system doesn't want to hear. Anything to add, Yuri? No, I, I agree that, you know, on one hand, you want to prevent misinformation. And uh, I guess having this kind of generic warning is, is much better way than censorship. But, uh, uh, I guess there's no really uh, like a win-win situation in this kind of emerging pandemic and um, a lot of unknown uh, emerging knowledge that we still don't know the kind of the, the truth value of so eventually everything will be sorted out and we shouldn't definitely shouldn't uh, censor or uh, let stop anyone from prevent anybody from speaking but on the other hand i think maybe having some sort of warning that uh, yeah all of these ideas are still uh, in the stage of you know unknown territory of their truth value maybe it's a good thing yep okay next one given dashik's paper posits a bat from malaysia as possible source what is the relationship between the wuhan cdc which collects bats and the wuhan institute of virology which works on bat borne viruses amongst them amongst others I must say, I don't totally understand the question. There, there are parts of it I get. Do you, do you understand the question? Well, I think uh, I, I, I may. Uh, so there's, I think there's two-part questions, really, two-part question, because, I mean, th there is this recent preprint by Dashek and others, or maybe it's already a, it's a published paper, that did posit that uh, it's probably, the SARS-2 is probably... If, it came from Malaysia because pangolins are normally found in Malaysia. And, but again, it's just a conjecture. I mean, they don't really have any, any solid evidence to back up that claim. 
and the, the second part of the question is the relationship between the Wuhan CDC that was like 300 meters from the Hunan sea mar Seafood Market and the Wuhan Institute of Virology because there was this uh, kind of original uh, idea by the Chinese scientist, I think, Xiao Botao, who published a preprint and, and thought that maybe it was someone working from someone working in the Wuhan CDC close to the seafood market that has inadvertently released uh, the kind of sample of bad coronavirus or maybe arthropod coronavirus or bat related coronavirus found in an arthropod because this was Jiang uh, Huan Tao or something I, I'm bad with names he's he's a, a tick guy he he is uh, investigating bat born ticks and so he had uh, been featured prominently in some Chinese publications where he was showing, collecting bats, finding ticks on them, bring, bringing those live bats and ticks back into the Wuhan CDC to collect, to extract the samples, to extract the coronavirus. And I think he boasted that he had been quarantined sometimes because he was exposed to bat blood or bat urine. And so this was the original idea of uh, this, this Chinese author, Xiao Batao, that maybe he's the, the guy who caused the outbreak. Uh, but then Xiao Batao pulled that preprint and kind of this, this uh, line of investigation of the one CDC being the possible origin of the lab leak, it kind of died down and the Wuhan Institute of Virology took uh, the center stage. But the, coming back to the question, there is a very close-knit relationship actually between the two institutions because, uh, first of all, there's many scientists that seem to have double affiliation, they kind of work in, in one and in the other, and sometimes they do work in, in the CDC, sometimes they go do work in WIV, and also there was a collaboration in the Wuhan CDC bringing live animals and extracting samples of various viruses, which they would then kind of turn over to the Wuhan Institute of Virology for further work or analysis or whatever. So there's uh, and there's been a lot of investigation online of w looking into this Wuhan CDC, what's going on there, because they were actually in the process of moving from that spot near the, the seafood market to somewhere more remote location. And they actually had, I think, a public tender uh, up on their website back in September that they had a huge pile of like toxic waste they needed to get rid of. And so, and there was a fire in the company that was later turned out that they won the this kind of the the contracts for clearing out the that toxic waste. So this, but uh, like too many very uh, interesting things going on that I, I might submit I haven't been following very closely. But the Wuhan CDC and its connection to first of all the live animals being kept there, and second to the kind of the arthropod vectors that Xi Jinping actually tried to distance herself from when she was scrubbing her database on December 30th. There's a lot of like potential for un unanswered questions that still we should still get answered, because you know ticks are found in bats, and there's some kind of tick uh, outbreak in the past I don't know, few years with Lyme disease and other diseases. And while ticks haven't been found to carry coronaviruses, they have been found to carry uh, closely related viruses, in particular by actually by this person, Jing Jing Quan. Tao from, from the Wuhan CDC, who actually had a paper on uh, like the whole history of uh, the whole host of viruses carried by, by ticks, bad born ticks. And, and there was, a, I think, another article in Pangolin ticks. This, this was just a, one area of research that I kind of gave up on way back when, looking into ticks and other arthropods, mosquitoes maybe, whether they could be the source of uh, either the natural source of the coronavirus or source of the leak, maybe, you know, they infected some lab animal and carried it out of the facility. But uh, I just, you know, for some reason, completely uh, give up on that uh, line of questioning. Maybe someone can pick it up and, and look into it. Yeah, I must say, uh, ecologically, something like a tick is much more plausible to me than something like a pangolin. I mean, even if it was a pangolin, a, something like a tick that could transmit it between a bat and a pangolin would, would make more sense than uh, some other mechanism. Am I right that the Wuhan CDC does not do gain-of-function research? I don't know. I wouldn't rule it out, but I, I think their lab is BSL-2 only, so 
Probably not. But again, I, I haven't looked into it, and, and they actually scrubbed the, the all the mention from their website on the Wuhan CDC of that location, and they actually changed the location of the of Wuhan CDC on Google Maps and Baidu and whatever, from the one near to the seafood market to the, probably the new new building to which they were planning to move to. It's much closer to the Wuhan Institute of Virology across the river. Yep. Um, but I mean, I'm sure people from the lab, if they probably engaged in some sort of uh, gain of function research because they were also affiliated with the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but they wouldn't do it like in, in that location. They would have done it probably in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, but they could have, of course, tracked back and forth whatever contamination they could have been contaminated with between the two. So, Yep. All right. We have just a few more here. Uh, another argument for gain-of-function research is being certain that we really do understand how a virus becomes infectious and which things affect its infectivity. Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, I mean, we can do it retro retrospectively if we found a vi virus, for example, a, a new human virus to the related bat virus, we can then look at, you know, what exact mutations in the receptor binding domain caused this, but then actually to do it proactively, to take some bad born virus and, and try to make it infectious for humans, to me, that's completely counterintuitive. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you want to do this? Again, as we already alluded to many times, there are a huge uncountable number of variations that could happen in nature, many of which could make a virus, you know, human, uh, born but never will happen in nature and trying to recreate it in the lab uh, just doesn't make any sense yeah I agree it seems like if you're going to do this sort of research you could have a model system that actually was far from humans and you could study infectivity in the model system I mean maybe this is done I don't know uh, but you're right the real danger is from increasing infectivity in humans or in human tissue in order to study the process in order to prevent an infection of humans. There's an obvious hazard that's going to be almost impossible to get around unless you uh, could figure out a kill switch or something so that nothing could possibly escape because it wasn't viable absent some uh, component that you controlled. Yeah, it's a good point because they do this in pseudoviruses and there's actually been a lot of this kind of research where it's not like true gain of function research where you create a live virus with a, a human receptor binding domain. You can do it in a pseudovirus where you put the receptor binding domain in a completely unrelated virus, which wouldn't be able to be viable on its own. I mean, it could infect human cells and you can then see it in, in a lab setting, but if it escapes, it, it wouldn't be able to propagate in a normal setting. Yeah. Why? I mean, it's it's limited, of course, because it's not a true virus. It's it's pseudo, that's why it's called pseudovirus. But I think for research purposes, it's good enough that you don't need to really then go into exponentially more risk and actually generate a live virus that is more infectious in humans than it was originally in the original host. Yeah. The problem with uh, a kill switch is, of course, it can evolve away, and the evolutionary pressure would be for it to evolve away. So you would have to build it very carefully so that the room for it to evolve away didn't exist. It has to really stop dead in its tracks uh, at the point that you're not fueling it in order for that to work. But anyway, it's a theoretical possibility. And for all I know, it's happening in some way that I don't, I'm not aware of, but all right, let's see. Another argument. Oh, uh, what is your opinion of Professor Michael Levitt's findings regarding how the response to COVID-19 should have and should be handled? Are you aware of this? Of what this is about? No, I'm not. Yeah, I have a feeling shortly after we end the stream, I'm going to realize what this is about or run across it and kick myself for not having a good answer, but I don't. All right. What is your opinion on Kerry Mullis, the inventor of the PCR test, who passed in August 2019? I must say I didn't know that he had died, if that's what that means. Stating that PCR tests should not be used to diagnose disease. 
see, questioning the HIV AIDS hypothesis, 30 years of dissent. Um, do you have thoughts? Well, I know that people have been drawing parallels between Karim Moulis and uh, Luc Montagnier, is that they're both uh, Nobel laureates who have since started expressing questionable ideas. Other than that, I mean, I don't know, just because, yeah, like a person has done good work previously doesn't mean they're right today. And well, conversely, just because, you know, their opinion might be not uh, popular or might not be supported by the kind of mainstream orthodoxy doesn't mean they're wrong. Yep. And I don't want to get into any hot water with other <laughs> novel laureates, which have been mentioned today in our Q&A, but I won't. It's very, very, at this point, uh, very dangerous territory to go into, yep. so I won't. Um, in terms of the PCR being able to not sh that it shouldn't be used for diagnosing disease. I, I think it's wrong, absolutely wrong. Why not? I mean, it's it's a great tool that have been uh, used by in many viruses to confirm that there's active viral or any other sort of infection that we can detect by using the PCR methods. Yep, I would say, um, you know, in Carrie Mullis case, obviously quite brilliant, uh, a little crazy, and my sense is it might be that um, a, certain, a certain amount of crazy combined with brilliance, combined with a whole hell of a lot of luck so you don't get killed off in the process of getting your credential, uh, might make you more likely to make an important discovery like PCR. Um, but then it might mean that you're more likely to uh, come up with things that have important kind of currency but aren't right, like the idea that HIV is not the causal agent in AIDS. And this is what I concluded, and I, I think I said somewhere previously, that the thing about concluding that HIV doesn't cause AIDS is AIDS is a syndrome. A syndrome is downstream of a failure in this case. Many things can cause that failure, and something that sometimes causes that failure cannot do it in certain circumstances because you're in a complex system. So we should actually expect that the two things that I think set Kerry Mullis off in this case, one, that not everybody with HIV gets AIDS, and two, that not everybody with AIDS has detectable HIV, you would expect those things just by virtue of the fact that the syndrome is downstream of something that could be triggered in multiple ways. So what that means is we have to change our mechanism for investing com investigating complex systems because a simple falsificationist obligation to, um, to Occam's razor doesn't work, not because it isn't philosophically right, but because complex systems tend to falsify every hypothesis by virtue of the fact that there are lots of processes interfacing with each other. So I don't know how much farther to go with that. <clears throat> but I do think, well, let's just let's just leave it at that. Mullis is a, a brilliant guy who contributed tremendously, um, and I think we have to take seriously what he says, but it doesn't make him right, and in this case, I think he's wrong. Uh, okay, last question. To avoid problems with kill switches, why not genetically engineer a super smart slave species that can conduct gain of function experimentation on unpopular human subjects, no lab leaks? Well, that's a terrible suggestion. I'm sorry I read it out loud. I'm pretty sure it's a joke, but damn, if you're going to make a joke, you got to include an emoji. That's the thing. That's how we know for sure. Um, okay. Well, Yuri, is there anything you want to say in closing? Uh, not really. Just wanted to thank you for uh, you know, organizing these chats. Uh, had a lot of fun doing it. So <laughs> thanks again. Yeah, thank you. I hope you, you bring on more guests uh, who are much more qualified than I to answer the virology questions and explore this hypothesis from all angles, not necessarily from the angle that we explore. I mean, if maybe Anderson you want to come on to your podcast and defend why he thinks there's virtually zero chance of this being a lab leak, I think it would be a great debate. Yep, I agree. So.
All right. So thanks. Thank you, Yuri. Uh, appreciate your your work and your dedication to this question. And uh, I hope we find out something interesting soon. And that would be a great excuse to have you back. <laughs> thanks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, appreciate the questions. Please like and subscribe. Pass this around if you thought it was interesting. And see you next time. <laughs>